But he also covered the game Super Bowl championship in the mid 1980s. Uh, and you think about all the characters he has seen, uh, got to know, uh, Dick Buckus to Mike Ditka, Steve McMichael, Bridge Perry. And uh, Don told me once that, you know, talking about the 85 Bears, even people in China, they knew about Bridge Perry. Uh, anyway, Don's going to give a short talk and then we'll do a QA up here. And then we'll open it up to questions. So, uh, Don, take it away. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. And I remember quoting you here. I, I thought I was going to be up there. Well, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. you know, from time to time, we like to uh, check with Forbes or somebody to find out Thompson's there's a book. 
So I want you to know this morning the bears are worth five billion with a B dollars. So my uh, mission today was to come and find out which one you guys are gonna buy. Because <laughs> that's what's trying to get us out of the anyway. You know, when David asked me to talk about the bears, I thought, well, you know, I can talk about the bears all day long. I hesitated because I'm not over there every day anymore, so I can't give you the day-to-day the -day updates. But then I got to thinking. In covering and following the bears for well, more than 50 years, I cover them for more than 20 years. In covering and following them for more than 50 years, uh, the story really hasn't changed that much. Uh, the narrative stays pretty much the same. I, I give uh, the same talk that I gave maybe in the 60s. So I think the changes, but mostly the same. I covered the 85 bears, as, as David said, and people might ask me, what, what was that like? Covering one of the great teams in, in NFL history, you make them. Casey was the most miracle team in the NFL history, one of the great sports teams ever. People ask me, well, what was that like? And they say, well, the biggest thing for me is I had to learn all new adjectives. I was used to the other kind. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'd like to give you just a bird's eye view of the bears with some historical perspective and all the open up the questions. But I first covered the bears in 1969. First game I covered for the tribute in 1969. Now, some of the long memories remember that was the year they were 1 in 13. It was only a 14 game season. They were 1 in 13. They tied the Pittsburgh Steelers with the weakest record in, in football. One. What you may not know is they weren't really that bad. They weren't really that bad. Gail Sayers led the league in rushing the field. Dick Lectus led a great defense. They were in games, they were competitive. They weren't really as bad as 113. Yeah. They had something to hang their head. And sorry to say, I'm afraid this year, I'm not so sure that they have a whole lot to hang their head. I mean, even when Abe Gibber told you to say, we may not beat him, we're going to beat him up. One of the preseason power rankings for the Bears this year had him at number 32. Now, most of you know there's 32 teams, though. So, do the rest. Last year, they were 27th in offense, 22nd in defense, and I'm not sure they got a whole lot better. So, the outlook is about the same and to illustrate how much the more things change, the more they stay the same. This year, the bear, what the Bears did to me was just about common. They fired a general manager named Ryan Pace and a coach named Matt Nag. And they hired a general manager named Ryan Poles and a coach named Mike Matt Eberfus. They fired Ryan and Matt. I have it. Now, if that's a recipe to that rock recipe, I'm not sure where you put What they do have going for them, I think, is, and sometimes this happens, is they have nowhere to go. Uh, there are zero expectations, and sometimes that's a good thing. One, one, of, the, one of the, David will tell you this, if you're around the athletes, many of you know this, one of the great motivators is disrespect. Don't disrespect somebody. And the Bears have exactly no respect. And that's, that could be a good thing. But I will, I will say, in the interest of trying to be a little positive, they do have something going for them this year that is a little different and could be significant. For years, the common denominator for all Bears failures was well. The lack, the absence of a real good, solid quarterback. I mean, going back to the 1969 season, the 1 13 season, they rotated along. We'll remember these names, but you all, Jack Concannon, Virgil Carter, and a rookie named Bobby Douglas. He's still around. <laughs> probably could, probably could still play. Anyway, uh, since that time, by my account, it's been 52 seasons since then, they've had 51 starting quarterbacks. 
Now, that's actually a good possibility, no matter what industry you're in, for any kind of sustaining success. And the only time they've been group of three in the 80s when Jimmy Mann was around. And even he never, as you will remember, was around for entire so never started all the games in the season. He was all he was always hurt. So now I think they hope they have a quarterback in Justin Fields since in his second year. But they're a long way from knowing that. And why? Because they don't appear to have a whole much else. So while they have, they've, they've had decent defenses, good players on offenses, decent teams, actually, but no outstanding quarterback. This year, they might have a quarterback without much else around. Three years ago, as they were alluded to, uh, uh, the Bears celebrated their 100th anniversary. And they commissioned me and our colleague, Dan, Dan Pompey, uh, to write the centennial book, a celebration of those 100 years. And George McCaskey told us, you know, I want you to write about our history, but I want you to write it warts and all. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> it's supposed to be a celebration. But I did say to George, you can't write this without writing about your 100 year quest, your 100 year search for a quarterback. <laughs> and he agreed, he agreed. And in doing that, in researching that story, it revealed what I think is, is something pretty intriguing, pretty fascinating. It might even serve to get him off the hook if you're a real friend. What it amounts to is that the Bears practically invented the modern day court. And it has come back to one. It's become the most important, the most difficult position in team sports, and therefore a difficult position to find and to develop if you do have a plan. And I'll tell you a little bit about this history, most of you know. 1939, the Bears drafted Sid Lockdown and turned him into the game's first strictly T formation quarterback. Prior to that time, the teams had played the most offenses were in a single wing or a double wing, and the quarterback was called a tailback, and he was behind the line of scrimmage, and he took a long snap. And the T formation changed the game completely. Uh, eventually made the quarterback the focus. And it changed the whole philosophy and the strategy, and then all the tactics on, on offense, all the angles of attack, the perimeters of the field, footwork work of the quarterback ever anyway. Quote from George Halas, I'm not reading. And when, actually, he, he, he made this in the 50s after Sid Lockman had won four championships during the 40s. In Sid, we created a new type of football player. Newspapers switched their attention from the star runners to the quarterbacks. We marked a new era for the game. Colleges changed from the single and double wing to the team using Luckman as the model and molding quarterbacks. In Sid's 12 years with the Bears, football was completely revolutionary. Now, of course, it's continued to evolve, especially in the passing game, rules that uh, have, have, rules over the years have limited defenses, what they can do used to be able to hit players when they came off the line of scrimmage, now they can't touch them. And their favorite offenses, they, uh, Blocking rules of, uh, have become easier. It, become, it becomes easier to block the defenses. And they've done this in order to promote more scoring. And this is turning much more and more pressure on the quarterback. And, and, and he obviously is the most important player on the field. And that makes the position the most difficult. And I thought it was the most difficult sports move. Some of the hockey fans in the other kind of hockey goal, perhaps in hockey would be more important than football quarterback. I don't know anybody in team sports that has more on his shoulders, more responsibility uh, than a quarterback. And, and this is all I've ever seen. So 
so what's happened is a supply and demand issue that the bears just simply haven't been able to manage. And a lot when they created, they created sort of a Frankenstein's monster, if you will, that's come back to devour. You know, there are 32 teams in the NFL, and there simply aren't 32 quality Super Bowl caliber quarterbacks. Now, somehow the Packers always seem to find them. <laughs> but the Bears have it. And that's why Justin Fields, to a lot of us, is so intriguing. And his college resident was impeccable. And I, I'm saying that not just because I went to Ohio State as well. It really is, a, it really is, a, he had an astonishing track record at Ohio State. Uh, but, and, and, and his predecessor, Mitch Trubisky, uh, did not have that kind of a college track record. But until Fields can translate that potential uh, on the field, it really doesn't matter. So, in, in, until until we know uh, that, that that the Bears have put enough people around him uh, to properly evaluate him, then we don't know whether he's the answer or the similar question. So, if if you're a Bears fan looking for progress in 2022, I would say. Don't look at the wins and losses. Look to see whether Fields has been given that chance to really prove that he's the man uh, that they want to build on. Because really, nothing else matters this year. Sorry to say, I can talk more about the, <laughs> about the rookies, a couple of them very promising, but the, I took on, on that happy, optimistic note we can open we can open We can get an idle question. We uh, have a seat for. Quick QA and I'll open it up. So, here, uh, both the 100 and people, you pick the top 100 there of all time, you and your co author. And who are the top three, and why did you choose to those three? Put me on the spot to see if I can remember this. Actually, the top ones weren't as difficult to find as they sort of sorted themselves out. I think, it, as I recall, uh, number three was, uh, what was it, Sayers? See, we were feeling that. I'm not sure. Well, I know number two was David Weiss. And number one, of course, was Walt and number one was easy because uh, Virginia McCaskey helped us take the only one to be sort of a White was to this day is the favorite player that I covered or, or still somewhat touched with. He was, he's so genuine. He was tough to cover all the time, but he's such a genuine guy. He, he has a, uh, uh, I think he still has a foundation that, that uh, promotes uh, fair play and and no no drug play, and uh, he's just just a delightful guy to talk to. Boy, he's he's got some stories too. But uh, then then Luckman and uh, Sayers the third and fourth, and I think Ditko was fifth. And then uh, his coaching as well, or as a player? No, I'm taking whatever he was to do as a player. It wasn't a, it wasn't his you know, it was all his players. And of course, he's the only tight end to be the Bears ever. It's me. Uh, he, he was a terrific player, even though it was only a year for like six years. Right. Yeah. And who uh, are there any Bears uh, you think should be in the Hall of Fame who aren't at this moment? That's interesting. Uh, I had dinner with uh, my colleague Dan Pape last week and followed me on the selection committee at the Hall of Fame. Unlike baseball, where there are over a thousand baseball writers that vote for the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, there are only there used to be only 28 of us, and now I think there are 40 uh, writers that pick the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So Dan followed me on that. Uh, bam. And he made a case uh, for Steve McMichael. And of course he did it because I mean, Michael's bat battling the ALS right now. It's, it doesn't always happen. We will like to honor these guys while they're still alive. And he made, he talked to a lot of people. I saw his presentation, he talked to a lot of people. And uh, 
Boy, he made a compelling case for McMichael because as good as that defensive line was, Hampton and Dan Hampton and Richard Dent already in the Hall of Fame. McMichael got it belongs there as well. He, he was he played more games than any of them, any bear in the middle of until I think he won it. So it was, uh, he was around forever. He, he was just a terrific player. And of course, the situation now is, is unfortunate. But uh, the other guy, the next guy to get uh, that I think will get in is Jeff Estes. And he, he comes up, and I don't know if it's this year or next year, but they think he has a little bit of chance to get in. And he, he's the best. He joined, we, we all saw him on the but this guy's the best in general I've seen. And, uh, you know, the 85 Bears historic team, he's a the best team ever. And it's hard to remember that. Uh, can you share a couple of stories from uh, covering the team that year? Just you know, some colorful stories. And not all are funny. <laughs> no, no, <I won't. laughs> no they, they were obviously my favorite team to cover because it was so easy to cover. It was a story. You always, you always had a story because all of them were eager to talk. One of the reasons I say they're the most, they weren't the best sports team or anything, it's just a matter. I, I think they were, they were the most memorable because they, they, they hit the national scene just on a cusp of 24 7 sport coverage and they embraced it. I mean, you could, you could argue that they helped make the ESPN. I mean, they, they were just. And, and did their course was at the forefront. We, we never wrote a story. We had stories the other day, but we never sent them in until we talked to Dick. Because he might drop everybody. He is his, his he, whatever he said might come in. Boy, this. Uh, well, I know the fridge when fridge William Perry came in, he really went in. Goody Brain didn't want to play any, any rookies. And Mike did uh, insist that he play William Perkard because he thought he'd make the defense that much better. So, what did Dick do? He put him on offense, if you remember. He put him in his fullback. Yeah. <laughs> and he became a national phenomenon. And in fact, he's the guy that, if you go to China, that's the guy they, 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 they remember. That's the guy they know. So anyway, he sort of embarrassed by when they put him on put him on, on defense. And as soon as they put him on defense, the defense uh, got from very good to great. And another but one of the stories that I'm thinking about it now, and you probably remember this as well. You know, Amy lost that there was in Miami on Monday night. And we didn't know at the time that at halftime we were struggling. And the team had to separate Buddy Ryan and Mike Dick from getting in a fist fight in the locker room. <laughs> and Dick and uh, Ryan had no use for each other at all, uh, which goes back. That, that was part of Dallas. Dallas always he promoted that kind of friction in his own stats. And we would have liked them. But uh, they had to separate him because Ryan. One of Wilbur Marshall, who was a linebacker, to cover the wide receiver for the uh, uh, Miami Dolphins. And Ditka said, You can't have a linebacker do that. And Ryan says, Yes, I can. And they almost got the fist fight in the front of the So that's, that's the kind of behind the scenes thing we found, we found out fairly soon because hardly anything was kept from that team there. They were all great talkers and really a great, great team. We will say that more people belong in the Hall of Fame, and they won even one more Super Bowl. They would have several players that would be up for discussion in the Hall of Fame because it was a terrific uh, assemblage of athletes. And we were talking earlier about who built that team, Jim Fanks, who was their general manager at the time. I'm going to digress here for a minute, but one thing that Jim did, if you look at his uh, drafting in 1975, until 1983, he drafted almost exclusively people that produced. And the last regime here, in other words, we had to have, I think she used to call it, the, I want to see the belt on the wall. Did this guy play in the Big Ten? Did he miss games? How good was he in college? The last regime, 
And I like the Ram Davis to me. Matt and I were fine people in the new football and so forth. But Ryan Pace drafted not, on, not so much on production, but on projection. If you look at his draft choices from the very first one, which is a receiver named White, right? Right. What was his Kevin. Name? Kevin. He was hurt. He was a great uh, prospect, but he was hurt. And he didn't have their last draft choice at, uh, last year after Fields, Kevin Jenkins. He's number 31 choice in, in, a, in a draft. I mean, he's supposed to a first round. You should be playing. He's got a bad back. He hasn't been on the field. He's a projection. You don't win with this guy. You might get lucky. So I, that gambling aspect of something, I think, is awesome. All right. I know there are a lot of people out here that want to ask you a lot of questions. So I'll stop asking and uh, raise your hand if you want to ask Don a question. Yes. Who is, I forget the guy's name, that's kind of the president of the Bears, but he's been there a long time. And I think he is, and yeah, I think he has kind of negated all this drafty uh, for the last 15 years. Well, actually, Ted, Ted is more on a, Ted came in as an accountant. He was, he's always been more on a, Involved in the finances of the and he's appreciating himself to, to the McCaskey family and was very close to them. And uh, to his credit, he's the one that negotiated the uh, renovation of Soldier Field. If he sticks around, I, I heard that he's, uh, he's close to retirement and may want to retire. He's the one that will uh, spearhead their effort to go to Arlington uh, Heights. Uh, I don't want to talk to him, Mark. I don't think uh, that he's really, he used to negotiate with contracts. So the NFL has, has a, a salary cap. They share all their revenue. They're all a bunch of socialists. Uh, they share their revenue. They, they, there's really not. The idea that the Bears skimp on money is, hasn't been true to So I don't think he gets the plan for it. The, the, the poor choices, uh, the bad choices. Of the yeah, I actually have two questions. First, do you think the McCaskies would ever sell the Bears? You know, I retired from Julia 15 years ago, and one of the reasons was I didn't want to cover that story. When Virginia is 99 years old, and we got to talk to her uh, during the, uh, we got to talk to her Two or three hours at a time, five times that we choose to rip very short. Uh, this was two or three years ago when we were doing the work. And the McCaskies are convinced themselves, this is what they say, that they're they're going to be able to navigate all the estate problems and everything. Now I I haven't found a lawyer that tells me that. And, and I'm not a lawyer myself, so I don't know how I'm going to do it. And they may be saying that just for Virginia's benefit, because her entire life's work has been to preserve the legacy of her father. And the idea of selling that team from that family, she just cannot, she can't even talk about herself. So there are, there were 11, she had 11 children. Nine of them surviving, I think. And uh, four of them work for the Bears. But I don't know. To, the, to answer your question, we don't know. And if it comes up for a vote, we sure don't. Because a lot, if they're worth $5 billion a lot of savings. And I'm sure that some of those kids and grandkids who, just, who don't have uh, anything to say about the Bears and just soon. Get a check. So I don't know how they're going to avoid selling them, but their, their, their public posture now is that they'll be able to uh, they'll be able to pass it down to their lips. All right. Wilbur Marshall or uh, Mike Singletary? If you had to pick one, who would better? More. That's a guy that, see, Mike, I love Mike. Mike was a great guy. Dan and I were talking about this the other day. He went into the Hall of Fame first. 
and she would have been in the Hall of Fame for it. I, you know, he benefited tremendously from the Hampton and the Michael and the Fridge. And he admitted, he said, when he got into the Hall of Fame, he said, I owe these guys uh, a debt of gratitude because I looked at some films, great about looking at film. Yeah, he had been able to touch them. I mean, these guys we made a whole lot of tackles, but he didn't have to like people didn't like fighters who had to fight off blockers. I mean, he was he was a great player going on and on. They had a lot of great players on the defense. And Marshall, people thought that it was only his second year, 85. And Dan Hampton felt like he's originally won the Super Bowl. He was he made that big of a difference. Because he was capable of covering the shooters. Even though Mike did to disagree. So we just want to talk about a big, big rival from Greenberg. And Greenberg is black and the standing for the last two or three decades. What's the difference? Why can't the Bears be different? And of course, on the other one. Yeah, yeah, if I, I guess if I knew the real answer to that, I was working for him. Uh, for one thing, after when Jim Fix was here, they had a strike uh, in which the general manager called the shots. And I remember when he got hired in 1974 by Monk's Alice, <laughs> who was George's only son. We asked him, well, wow, what, what's Fix going to do? What's his authority? He said, he's coming here to run a show. Peter, he's coming here to run a show. And he pretty much did. And then when uh, Monks died in 1979, he was only 53 or 54 years old, of a heart attack. Instead of making, and, and, and Alice himself was, uh, I think he was about 80 then, 81. And instead of making uh, Phoenix as president of the Bears to succeed Monks, who would become president. George reinstated himself as well. So he went back and then he ended up hiring Dickens for him. And, and so I guess you could argue it turned out. But that structure that that most teams, most good teams flourish under sort of got ignored, got abandoned. And then in the meantime, in 1983, when when free agency came in. The Bears didn't really have a kind of structure uh, that, that was people dealing with three weeks. And, and the best teams were able to do that. That's, that's part of the answer. So you take Green Bay or other, Green Bay had Ron Wolf, and they had, they had just great general managers. Uh, and uh, let's see, I can't remember the second thing I was going to say about that. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Now, um, it'll come back, it'll come back to me. But I had a great thought <laughs> about, uh, about, about why the Packers and other teams uh, seem to be able to. Uh, oh, oh, I it is a great thought. Um, <laughs> but the next couple of like any uh, big organization, has its higher on a league level. And Jim thinks. For example, was the chairman of the uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, competition, competition, which essentially makes the rules. And since thinks the Bears have never had anybody, and these guys on any committee, whether they're on the fan committee, committee, or they're on the board, the Bears and the Cassidy family never seems to have somebody that's in real. It's really on a real important committee where people network and you find out where the, where the next great general manager might be sitting in a personnel office or the next great coach who is an assistant somewhere. I think that's where it's like, you, know, like you, you find out, you find out by networking. And the players since Phoenix has left uh, never have seemed to be able to take Phillips and, and George Berlin, Michael, they were on committees, but they weren't really players, if you know what I mean. So I, I think that, that that's really part of it. They're nice people, uh, but they're, they're a little out of the way. Right. 
And, and to, you know, Virginia was that she never to this day, she the president never ever expected her mom to be a shark. She always thought her brother would take over the bears, and she would just be uh, a spectator, a fan. And when you see what George went to ask, he says, No, George is a great. Man. And you see what he says, No, I'm just a fan. Wait. And you better be more of a fan if you're running an NFL ranch. It's not as bad. To that point, isn't it a little embarrassing that they keep having to hire a consultant to hire a new job on that? I, I, I don't think so. It was a uh, it was uh, Ernie and Corsi who helped them uh, find uh, uh, patient and, and Maggie, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. And then George, and uh, he was the former general manager of the New York uh, Giants. And then the Caskets do know the memories. That's how they got to earn them. And then they uh, know their consultant to help them hire the present uh, the administration was Bill Foley, who uh, He's a Hall of Famer from Indianapolis. He worked in the USFL in, in Chicago for a while. So they have a relationship with him as well. But to not have anybody in the building with that kind of uh, information that, that, that kind of resonate is a uh, tells you something. Right. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you think Arlington Heights is a fait accompli? Uh, I don't think it's a great company when it comes to bears, but uh, I, I I think I think if you're a sports fan in Chicago or or an entertainment fan, uh, you probably should be for it. I mean, that could be a that that could be a great. Uh, obviously, the bears are the bears, of course, are, would be key players, but they even play 10, 11 games there a season. That's not enough to sustain that kind of complex. But to me, I think what's not right, and this is another subject, is uh, the gambling matches. Gambling has become a big, big player in all the sports. You're gonna, and I think it's unfortunate, but I, what do I, I'm too, I think we're gonna see scandals like you haven't seen since a lifetime. But, uh, uh, but when I, when I do think that you're going to see, I mean, the Bears, the Bears and the NFL are already partners with all these gambling entities on, online. And you're going to see, just like you used to go to the racetrack, you're going to be able to go to a Bears game and go up to a car mutual and go to halftime and put that stuff. I can't see how that's good for the game. But when you come, there's a lot, a lot of money there. And I would think those gambling interests would be interested in them. In uh, developing out of the park. Yes. How did you get any sports? How could I get into it? I never got out of it. You know, I, that's how I got into it. You know, when I was a, when I was a, a kid in high school, I, I worked with a school paper in the art portion of sports. And then I went to college and I, I got into the paper and I like sports and, and there were it was it was always a temptation to get out of it and and, and there were uh, uh, offers to get out of it and so forth. But I understood I, I like journalism, I like to write. And I got to thinking, you know, if, if I become a general assignment reporter, I might get sent out to cover the school board maybe. And I think I'd rather cover a, a baseball game than a school board game. So I, I thought that the that that the, the the bottom line of sports was was a little more interesting than the bottom line of other journalism. <laughs> uh, other other journalism. Then when I came to the trigger, he said, "Well, you went to Ohio State. You must know about football. So you want to cover the Bears?" I said, "Well, yeah, I'm sure. Let me think about it." So it just I was just lucky, really, and. Anybody that's interested in sports journalism, first of all, I hope, I hope you're interested in journalism first because the sports, everybody thinks I'm a sports expert. Half of you guys in this room know more about sports, as much about sports as I do. People walking down the street know about sports. It's a, it's a great hobby that's become bigger over the year. It's big business. So, sports shouldn't be the, the real 
a correction to the journalism and the reporting in the way that that's what that's what's really of interest. And, and by the way, I'll put in thought for all journalists. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope everybody is that the truth of this is more than to be no more space than this, but the, 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 the media is still uh, uh, a pillar of democracy, and I hope they're all supportive. We're going to we're gonna have to we're going to have to buy our journalists because the, the old model of uh, of paying for journalism through uh, advertising is uh, is kaput, at least as far as the print journalism is concerned. That's just a flaw. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, I'm Sarah Bernard. I'm from Boston. Uh, I know, I know Roger for about four years ago, the big guy, and then probably impossible. Not even, that's impossible. Because he's working for the 32 owners, and he can't say what he would uh, like to say. Uh, if you look at the, the, the current uh, situation now with the, uh, the quarterback from uh, from uh, Cleveland, Deshaun Watson, what? He sort of, Roger sort of stepped away from it. And eventually he might have to call final shots, but I think he'd just soon be hands off and sort of stuff. I don't envy his job. He used to be a ball boy. I think he'd rather be a ball boy. Ruben and I have a lot of that. I like him first. I know Odie had a question. He was at the 1963 championship. Oh, right. Have you thought out? Have you thought out yet? Yeah. That's the one thing people tell me when I went to that game that they froze. <laughs> and they do uh, a Super Bowl uh, on this day. Uh, uh, it's an impression. You did leave Super Bowls on the table, and I just want to tell you that I don't think they would have gotten their first one to die. He was a perfect guy. I remember players telling me he was the first coach players had been there. He was the first coach that came in the very first meeting. He said, We're going to win Super Bowl. So he put the goal out there right at the beginning. And uh, he couldn't run without the players of that, but I'm not sure those players could run without him because. He was a terrific, terrific motor. That's that's what he went for. Uh, he, he wasn't much of a strategist. Uh, he left that to others, and he really he didn't know or anything about defense. And he thought he knew more about offense than he did. Uh, but he was a terrific motivator. He was a player's coach at the beginning. Now, once the nineteen eighty seven. Uh, Strike came along, and he said these aren't the real bears. He lost. So to answer your question, yeah, uh, when they put the replacement on on a different job, they remember they in 1987 that they had a replacement or a replacement team strike breakers that came in and played by the season, and did they call them the real bears? Well, that that was not smart. I was at a lot of course. I come to Woody Hayes, so when I came here, I was not intimidated for anything. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Tom, thank you. What a great uh, talk. And thank you, Woody. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Gordon. Oh, he does. Let me see. Yeah, Yeah, it's well, yeah. Just, 